Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, uh, before I start speaking, it's always a privilege of mine when I get to speak to what I call God's people. It's not like auctioneering at all. For 12 years, I was an international art auctioneer, so I went all over the world. Um, pretty much been to every single country, uh, numerous times over, and speaking in front of hundreds of people selling art. That's what I did, uh, high-end artwork. So it's a completely different feeling though when you get to talk about God. So uh, it's always a privilege of mine. So but before I start, I would ask you, I'm going to be quite honest today and open uh, with some things I'm going to say. So I would ask you to try not to judge um, and try and let uh, my story speak to your heart. And we'll go from there. <clears throat> you know, as a kid, I loved fairy tales. I was that child that totally believed in fairy tales, okay? I was the little girl who put all my dolls up on the bed and would read them fairy tales. I love fairy tales so much, I made up my own fairy tales, okay? You know, along comes Prince Charming on the white horse and picks you up and rides you off to his castle far away. And you know, I was speaking to my girlfriend the other day and I said to her, what happened to the fairy tale, okay? Because life has not been a fairy tale. You know, the Prince Charming that picked me up and took me off to his castle far away? Turns out, I had to clean it, okay? <laughs> and then it went into foreclosure, okay? Not good. I, the Prince Charming, I kissed him, he actually turned into a frog. <laughs> so life has not been a fairy tale. But you know, if you know me, I'm still like this hopeless romantic. I just, you know, believe in true love and uh, till death do we part and happy ever after and all that. And I thought to myself, why is it that we have this need for romance, that we have this need for uh, this fairy tale life or this, this want for intimacy? And it's because we were created for it. That's what God created us for. He created us first and foremost for a romance with Him. I know that might sound strange, but uh, I one time heard somebody say that we were created out of the laughter of the Trinity. Wow, that's good. Wow. The Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, they share kind of a heroic intimacy in heaven. And the only way I can think of that is, you know the best time you've ever had, maybe with your family around the Thanksgiving table? And it's like the best meal and the best conversation and you're laughing or with your best friend in the world where you're laughing so hard you've got tears coming down your face. You know that feeling? I think that's, that's what it must be like in heaven. That must be just a taste of what it's like between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But you know, I don't, uh, I don't know why we don't see God that way. I mean, He wants this romance with us. He wants this intimacy. That's why He created us. You know, God didn't create us because He needs somebody to love. He is love. He created us to share that with Him. Um, but we don't see Him that way. And uh, I wonder why. But I know as I've traveled the world, as I said, I, I've uh, traveled for 12 years. I've met a lot of people. <coughs> and I found that everybody's got their own view on God. Have you met these people? Everybody's got their opinion on God. Um, and you know, the way they see God. Some people see God like this uh, dictator God, you know, and he's out to smite you and he causes the hurricanes and bad things to happen. And there's the Gandalf God, you know, from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> he's just kind of watching from a distance. The sugar daddy God. Yeah, we all got this one. He like, they, they serve me, they got convenience and comfort. And then my favorite one, which I think a lot of people are, is the genie in a lamp God. If I do things the right way, if I say the prayer this way, if I go to church and do the right things, he will prevent bad things from happening. And I'll walk in convenience and comfort. But just because you believe something Amen. doesn't make it true. And when belief and truth are confronted, truth will win. I found that in walking with God, that God is a, a person. He's a person with feelings. He's a person that wants to be known. He wants to be loved. He wants to be pursued. You know, the Bible says, knock and, and, he, will, and he will answer you. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you in James 4 verse 8. And why is that? Because God wants us to pursue Him first. He wants us to go after Him. Because uh, you will, my, one of my favorite quotes, it says, you will never possess what you are unwilling to pursue. Because pursuit really is the evidence of your desire. When you reach out to God, He will meet you where you are. doesn't matter what stage or what uh, path you're on. Whenever you reach out to God, He will meet you. And when, you, when God does show up, I'm telling you, it is one of those experiences that you never forget. 
and maybe that's still coming in your life or maybe you have had that when you've had that experience you realize something you realize that God is after your heart it's like the most important thing to God is your heart um, because our heart is the key to Christian life it really is um, Oswald Chambers well-respected Christian author, many people love, when I, I love his work. He says, it is by the heart that God is perceived and known, not by reason. So you can't think it, you can't find God with your head. Faith really is God perceived, which means to be known and trusted by our hearts. Proverbs 4 verse 23, it says, above all, guard your heart. What does that mean? Above everything else in your life, protect your heart, guard it. Why? Because God knows this is the wellspring of life. Where all true hurt, all true worship, all true love comes from your heart. So He wants you to protect it because it really, uh, when we talk about hurt, that is where hurt goes and stays. <laughs> but the truth of the gospel was intended to free us to be able to love God and love others with a whole heart. God doesn't want you to live your life with half a heart. It's just no fun that way. Because He also knows that to lose heart is to lose everything. I'll never forget where I was. I was uh, 22 years old. I had actually just gotten off a cruise ship because I did a lot of the selling of the artwork on the cruise ships. I was 22. They let me off the ship early because I was actually flying back to Oklahoma. I graduated from Old Roberts University and I was flying back to go walk because I'd finished school early. And um, I went back to, uh, I was in Tulsa and the phone rang and it was a lady from my, my dad's church in San Diego and she said, she sounded pretty distraught on the phone and she said, um, are you alone? I thought that's a weird thing to say to me, are you alone? I said, well, yes. Yeah. She goes, are there any friends around you? I said, I can get some. <laughs> I know people. <gasps> and she said, your dad needs to talk to you. I was like, okay. And my dad got on the phone and his voice was distraught. And I knew something was wrong. And he said, Cindy, you need to come home now. Mom's had a terrible stroke. Um, they don't think she's going to live through the night. She has, they think she's got an aneurysm on the brain and it could go at any second and she's going to, she's not maybe going to live through the night, she's going to die. I was like, what's a stroke? What do you mean a stroke? She had sneezed and coughed so hard at the same time she ruptured the artery in her neck. It's a fluke, one in a billion chance of happening. Um, but she was dying and just kind of like in the movies, you know, the phone dropped. Everything started to spin around me. I was like, what, what do you mean she's dying? I'm 22, what do you, she can't die. And it was like somebody put their hand in my chest and just ripped my heart out. And I, I started to cry. I was like, God, you gotta save my mom. You gotta save my mom. What do you, what's happening? And they got me a flight and I got on the plane and flying back to San Diego. And I'm like crying and I'm writing in my journal. I'm like, Lord, you have to save my mom. She's been the biggest giver I know. She's served in the ministry her whole life. She's got such a heart for you in the kingdom. You have to save her. And uh, we'd be at the hospital and in the emergency room and they make you go in every hour on the hour to say goodbye. Uh, her brain was swelling at such a rate they didn't know what to do. They wanted to you know, cut her skull open and let, take part of the skull out and put it in her stomach and let the brain swell out. My dad and my mom had a contract that they signed that said they will not allow any heroic things to be done to them to save their life. So my dad said, no, you know, we'll, just, we'll pray and do what you can do. But And the thing is, it, it, the situation was getting worse. Uh, you know, we were there for 10 days in intensive care and, and the surgeons, bless their hearts, uh, would come out and with the worst news possible and they would say, you know, the brain is so damaged that uh, she's never going to walk, she's never going to talk, she's going to be a vegetable for the rest of her life. You, you know, this is not a good situation, don't have any hope because there's so much damage to the brain. One night I, I went home with my dad and hearing all this bad news, my mom would hate to live like that. And I just said to my dad, I go, do you think maybe we should let mom go and be with Jesus and stop holding on? Are we holding on for us? Like, do you think we should just let her go and be with Jesus? 
My dad turned to me and he said, I'd rather carry her on my back for the rest of my life than live one day without her. Uh -oh. <laughs> Crumpling, heroic love. And the days went by. How do you make this thing? The bottle doesn't fit back under there. And once you open it, it's like a trick, Milan. I'm like, I'm blonde, you know. I use it when I need it. No judgment here. So, you know, the days went by. My mom's in intensive care, and now it's turning into months. And now I'm getting mad. Because I'm looking at her and like, you know, she's brought her out of intensive care and um, she can't speak. She's paralyzed on the right side of her body. Uh, the only word she could say was no, which is very appropriate for my mom. But, uh, you know, and I'm looking at her and the doctor's like, she's never going to walk. This is paralyzed. And now I'm starting to go, God, where are you? I don't understand. Where are you? Like, wh why aren't you healing her? My parents believe in healing, they believe in faith, they've got it all. Like, why aren't you healing her? Where are you? How can you let this happen? I mean, her life, she's been perfect. She's given you everything. How can you let this happen? And I got so angry with God that in that moment, I, I took his heart and I put it on trial. <clears throat> and I judged the goodness of it. Because I didn't understand how he couldn't or wouldn't heal her. And I think that's what happens sometimes, you know, we get, we get hurt, maybe you have a, a friend or a lover that you've had a quarrel with and you, they hurt you and they hurt you so bad and you think, you know what, I, I, I can still love you but I'm never going to trust you again because in that moment God broke my trust and that happens in life. People hurt us, they break our trust and we think, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be that vulnerable, I'm not going to allow you that close to my heart. But you know, I was raised a Christian and so there's no way I could ever not believe in God, you know. That's just not an option. <laughs> he's there, he's real and the whole bit. So I still went to church. I still gave God my service. I still read my Bible. I even prayed. I gave him my service but I refused to give him my heart. And I think I became a lot like the Israelites where it says in Isaiah 29 verse 13, These people worship me only with their words. They honor me by what they say, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship doesn't mean anything to me. Because that's what Israel had. They had their life their, of rituals and rules and religion, but God was not in it. And I see that a lot in the church today. You know, you have those people that you see and they're such hard workers in the church. They're there early, they stay late, they do everything. And on the outside it appears that, wow, this person has really got their act together with God because they're doing all this stuff for God. But what does their heart say? What happens when they're alone? And I remember my mom said to me one time, she said, you know what, Cindy, God doesn't matter if you never do another thing for Him as long as you live, as long as you love Him with all your heart. As long as your heart is right with Him, that's what He cares about. <clears throat> but you know, God is always wooing us back. Like the lover in the story, he doesn't just let us go. He doesn't just go, okay, well, you've run away. He runs off to us. Revelations 3 verse 20 says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. This is a picture of Jesus knocking on our heart's door to let, you know, to come inside and, and have this romance with us. But my trust was broken. I felt betrayed. I felt hurt. And I wasn't sure what God was holding back from me. I was like, well, if he won't heal my mom, what else, what else, what, what other good things are you, not, are you keeping from me? What are you holding back? What is behind this mystery that I don't know about? I've been, I've walked the straight and narrow my whole life. I've done everything the right way. And what are you holding back? What don't I know about? And you know, I'm an adventurous soul. I'm a, I'm a curious soul, should I say. I like the, the fun adventures, the craziness, the highs. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to live my life my way. So. I ran off to the adventures, I ran off to the highs, and I ran so fast I, ended, I landed myself in a motorcycle accident where I flipped seven times at 50 miles an hour. Wearing shorts and a t-shirt, thank God for the helmet. But I'm alive today and standing here because I've got praying parents, folks. That is nothing about me. I should have been dead. By everybody's account, I should have been dead. So, um, it's a 
it's kind of a crazy story that I was away working on a cruise ship and uh, I was in Curacao, <coughs> the Dutch islands in the Caribbean and uh, I was on the back of a motorcycle where I shouldn't have been. Uh, <coughs> came off it, took a corner, couldn't make it, came off the bike, flipped seven times, hospital. Uh, and while I was laying in the hospital, it's kind of a cool story, not the accident part, but the rest of it. Uh, my parents were away in South Africa at the time preaching, and I didn't know this, but the Holy Spirit had woken my dad up that morning. Wow. And he was, for a deep, like he had an overwhelming sense to pray, and like deep praying, like praying in the spirit, praying in the spirit, and he prayed for an hour and he said he couldn't get the feeling to go, couldn't get it to go. Finally, he prayed until it lifted and he, all he could think about was me and he was like, well, you know, you know, hope everything's fine. They on the other side of the world, me flipping seven times, 50 miles an hour, I'm laying in the hospital and uh, because I was on the cruise ship, they were communicating with the doctor on the ship because, you know, they're telling them what's going on and, and later on uh, I had heard the story from the doctor's side as well, who was a good friend of mine, so he had said that, uh, I, me I remember them depressing on my chest, I was fully conscious, I remember every single moment of the accident and I remember um, then, you know, I was having such trouble breathing, they were pushing down on my chest and I would breathe in and then they would let go and then they'd push down, I'd breathe in, let go and sign a punctured lung. This is what they tell me later. Uh, I was an athlete my whole life so I knew instantly my arm was broken um, and uh, the guy was riding, that he broke his leg in four places because my body hit his body so hard it pushed him all the way under the metal dividers to the other side of the freeway. And um, while we are laying in the hospital, they'd like wheel you in for an x-ray and then they wheel you back out and wheel you in for another one and wheel you back out and after the third set now all the doctors are in my room they got EKGs on me and they've got this you know thing and they're like looking at all these x-rays and now they've left my friend with his full broken bones and everything and they're just in with me and this is the third set of x-rays I'm like finally I speak up and I'm like what's wrong just tell me please what's wrong and the doctor looks at me in her broken English and she said nothing that's the problem <laughs> I was like, wait, what? What do you mean nothing? She goes, well, look at your x-ray. She's like, this x-ray here is of your arm. She's like, you see this clear line here? She's like, your arm is broken. I was like, yeah, I know, I can tell. She said, so we wheeled you back in because we can tell there's flake fractures in your arm and we can't tell which other bones were broken. Wow. In the second x-ray, that line is now appearing fuzzy and we can't see any other breaks. So we took you back in for a third set to see what a better view of the shot. And she's like, as you can see, there's no more break. There's no more line in the third x-ray. Mm. My arm healed as I lay there. She said, you've got, she's like, we thought you had a punctured lung. She's like, you've got four cracked ribs. You've got four broken ribs. You're going to have trouble breathing, but there's no puncture in your lung. She's like, your knee, your knee is ripped up. You need stitches and your back is going to need some, some work, but uh, you can go. <laughs> yeah. I know, it was an amazing story too because on the cruise ship they didn't allow, if you had broken a bone, you weren't allowed back on the ship because if they had you in a cast or anything, they couldn't, stop, you could die supposedly. So they wouldn't have let me back on and at the time I had no insurance, I was in Curacao, my family was in South Africa, I wouldn't have been able to get home, I would have been stuck in some island and because I got back on the ship they took care of me and bandaged me up and stitched my knee and then they paid for my flights home and everything else and of course when my dad walks in the door <laughs> on his way home, I said, I called him and he's ride home from the airport, I said, don't panic but I've been in a motorcycle accident. <laughs> and he was like, what day was this? And of course he tells me his side of the story and, and uh, I, I had like tears rolling down my face because I knew I was not living the way I should have been living. That guy was in the back of his bike. I should never have been on the back of his bike. He was a complete atheist. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, actually I got uh, the chance to see him. I never saw him after the accident for eight years. And eight years later I saw him when we were in London and we sat down one night to have dinner and we talked about it and he told me his version uh, of what had happened and he said, Cindy, you know, I was a complete atheist. He's like, I don't, I don't believe in God. And he said, but that day, the hand of God, I felt, came down and carried us and put us down. He said, we should have been dead. He said, there's no way we could have gotten away from that accident alive. And his life, that changed his life. He took a whole new course in his life after that. But you know, it really shook me up because I thought to myself, wow, I really wasn't doing the right thing, I really wasn't living the right way, and God didn't go, 
wow, you deserve that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? right. Like I expected right. him to. He saved me. Yeah. He protected me. I, I just, I was like, wow, maybe I do have the wrong view of God. Yes. Maybe, I, maybe, uh, I, I, maybe I have got a mistaken idea of God's love Grace. and His faithfulness. And one, one day I was reading my Bible, and I was reading Hebrews 13, verse 5, and it was like, like I always imagine God, the lover of the story, and He comes and He like knocks on my, my heart's door. And I was reading, and it says, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not. I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down. I will not. And you know, as I was reading that, it was like, if you've ever had that experience where you've, Maybe somebody feels like you've hurt them and it's like you, you love them so much and you're trying to tell them, I, I didn't mean it, it wasn't me, I'm sorry, you know, I love you so much, I'll never let you go, I'll, I'll be there for you. It was like God took my, my heart like that and He was holding it and that's what I felt like He was saying, I'll never, I'll never leave you, Cindy, I'll never forsake you, I've got you, I'll take care of you. And instantly my heart broke and I just started to cry and I was like, wow, He loves me. And in a second God spoke to my heart and He said, Cindy, people will lie and people will die. They are going to let you down, even through death, because they're human. You cannot put all your trust, all your hope, all your faith, all your love in a human being, because they will break your trust, even through death. And he said, but I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. Trust me. My heart is good. And I, in that moment, I, I, was, I was weeping, because my mom had been my everything to me. You know? That was, that's who I went to when I needed something. Mom, I need money. Mom, there's this guy. Mom, you need to pray to God because. It was never me and God. It was me, Mom, and God, you know? So when Mom was practically taken from me, I didn't know what to do. But in that moment, I realized that I have to trust God, that I have to lean on Him, like He's going to be the source, that, that, that he's, His heart is good. And uh, so I started to, you know, my journey with God continued and it started to blossom. And then, of course, back to the journey of life, just when you want to add the words to the fairy tale, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> I got divorced. <laughs> you know, and I thought I knew what pain was when my mom had the stroke. <clears throat> But divorce tears you up. Yeah. Divorce rips apart whatever dreams you ever thought you had. It destroys your confidence in yourself. Yes. It destroys your hope in any decision to make a, a, a your decision making ability. Um, I know why God doesn't want it because it's so painful and it hurts people so badly. Mm -hmm. um, I, the pain doesn't stop. It just didn't stop. Maybe some of you can relate. I remember one day my dad walked in, it was Christmas morning, and he said, How are you? How's the pain? And I said, Only hurts when I breathe. <laughs> Every minute of the day. So I, I couldn't make it stop. Nothing I, I did could, to, could stop the pain. So I tried everything. I tried alcohol. <laughs> I'm not talking about a glass of wine or two with dinner, folks. I'm talking about bottles of alcohol to make the pain stop. So that by the time the pain stopped, I would pass out and go to sleep and then wake up like four hours later with the worst hangover in the world. So now the pain was here and here. That didn't help. It's like this theory, this is not working for me. <laughs> you know? Um, but you try everything and just so quickly the devil comes with his lies. Yes. Your parents prayed your whole life. How did you marry the wrong guy? You know, how could you not see this? Why couldn't God intervene and fix him? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's big as it's known. <laughs> so, but he's got his lies in your ear so quickly, right? To undermine God's faithfulness, to undermine his goodness. And, you know, I was just like, you know what? I have been hurt so bad. I am done giving anybody my heart. I am locking it away, okay? I'm putting bulletproof glass around it. Guys on outsides with AK-47s, you're not getting to this heart. Don't even try. You know, that's it, locking it away. And then I would, I would lay there alone in my bed at night and like, my heart would cry out from its prism of safety and say, you know, really? You're going to live like this? You're going to live so dull and loveless and lifeless? You were created for more. You were created for romance. You were created for adventure. You were created for beauty. Come on, you know, you can't live like this. So I thought to myself, 
you know what, you're right. I'm going to appease my heart my own way. I'm going to, I'm going to give it beauty. I'll give it everything at once. I am going to, and so what I did is I took my traveling on high gear. I was already traveling all over the world, but I, I, I literally took it on high gear. I went to, I've spent nights in Russia. I've walked on the Great Wall of China. I've been to Antarctica. Um, and I would, I would be laying on the beach in Tahiti, just trying to soak up the sun and enjoy the day. And it was like God would come and go, do you like it? I made it for you. Are you enjoying yourself? Is it nice and peaceful? I'm like, shh, leave me alone. Wow. Try to enjoy Tahiti. You know, I'd be mean, watching the glaciers melt in Alaska. That's one of the coolest things you ever get to see. You know, having coffee, watching the glaciers melt, and the Holy Spirit comes. Isn't this amazing? amazing? Don't you love what God did for you? Are you enjoying this? No, shh. I just didn't want him that close. I don't want to feel you and everything. Why do I have to see you and everything? Why are you in the creation? Why are you everywhere? And of course, I was still, you know, serving God, loving him at this time, but I just didn't want him that close to me. Just didn't want anybody that close to my heart. And I couldn't get away from God. I couldn't get away from his love. And it's because in Psalm 34, verse 8, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. Everything around you reminds you of his goodness. Yeah. <laughs> And even though I tried to shut out God and His intimacy, it was like my heart hungered for more. I had this hunger in me for more, more love, more intimacy, more romance. I was like, why is this? Why do we have this craving for more all the time? And nothing I tried in the natural worked. I, I read this thing in Ecclesiastics 3 verse 11 one day and because I had such a craving in my soul for more and a deep hunger for more. And I thought, why is this? Why do we always want more in our life? And Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He also has planted eternity yes. in our hearts and minds. Yes. A deeply implanted sense of a purpose working through the ages which nothing under the sun but only God can satisfy. Yes, right. Yes, right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Got it. So basically he's put a little bit of heaven in here and here. Yes. And you're searching for it. And you're like, nothing, nothing tastes good. I want more, I want more. It's because it's heaven. You're never going to get it till you get there. And only God can give you that satisfaction. And I was like, wow, that explains it. Okay. You know, so I had all these, I was searching these meaningless pursuits and not getting anywhere. <coughs> One day I was reading, God seems to talk to me a lot when I read, I was reading a book by John Alridge called The Sacred Romance and I've read a lot of these books, I love John Alridge's work and if I had my way I'd have you all bound to the seats with your eyes taped open and forced to read it, that's just me. Um, but uh, in this book John Alridge talks about the hero in the story. What he does is he, he, he puts everything in God's perspective. Because a lot of us seem to think like God is the author of the story and we're all characters in the play and we're all kind of waiting for our next line. Are we on the next page? Are we in the next scene? You know, where are we? But he takes it and he changes the, the, the way we look at the story and he puts God in the story. Not as just the author, but in the story, as the hero in the story. So if you would indulge me for a minute and let's look at the story with God in it. Let's go all the way back to heaven, before creation, um, big war in heaven, Lucifer deceives a third of the angels. What lie could he possibly have told the angels to deceive them from the presence of God? What do you think God's holding back? What do you think he's not sharing with you? Do you think his heart's really good? He deceives a third of the angels, big war in heaven, boom, all cast down. Now. God comes down to create earth. Imagine for a minute. Maui, Yosemite, blackberries, horses, Cabernet grapes. <laughs> but you know, I love the Bible. I think the Bible is like the king of understatements. Because you know, God comes down, creates all this, the universe, the Milky Way, and in Genesis he goes, it's good. Yes. You know, really? <laughs> Such an understatement. But anyway. He creates all this and he creates Adam and Eve and what does he say? Here, do you like it? Do you like what I've made for you? Oh, I hope you enjoy it. But you know, in order for a true romance to occur, God had to give Adam and Eve something. Mm -hmm. He had to give them freedom. Amen. He had to give them free will. He had to give them freedom to reject him. Mm -hmm. Because in order for somebody to love somebody back, you have to be free to reject them. I, my mom always said to me when I was growing up, Cindy, one day a guy will love you as much as you love him, and then it'll be magic. 
Because I'd be like, Mom, why doesn't he like me the way I like him? Okay, maybe not you, just me then. Um, but in order for that true romance to occur, both people have to be allowed to reject the other person. God gives Adam and Eve free will, and what do they do? They sleep with the enemy. Yeah. Imagine on your wedding night if you ran off and slept with somebody else. Imagine the betrayal your spouse would feel. I mean, you can almost hear the shock in God's voice in Genesis when he comes down and he goes, what is this you've done? What have you done? The God, don't picture the fall of man like a, 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 a theft or a crime. Picture it like a betrayal of love. You think God doesn't know what it feels like to have his heart broken? He, you don't think he knows what it feels like to be betrayed? In that moment, that absolute betrayal of his love and his trust. Because what happened? The enemy came with what lie? What do you think God's holding out on you? What is with this tree? Really? If God, God is a good God, really? He's not going to care. Anyway, what's he keeping back from you? What's he holding out? What don't you know about? Trust me, don't trust him. It's the same lie, folks. Yes. Because if all the enemy has to do is get you to undermine God's faith, unfailing love, your confidence in God's unfailing love and He's got you. If you can't trust the hero in the story, if you can't trust Superman, who can you trust? But God doesn't, He doesn't stop. He makes a way. He runs after us. Even into our darkness, even when we run away, He runs after us. He sent His Son to die on the cross. How painful is that? How painful was that for Him to watch? His own son dying, but he knew he had to, to make a way for you and I to come back so we could live in his grace, so we could live in his righteousness, so we could be in right standing with us because he's got such amazing things planned for you, such good things for you to walk in. The enemy has lied to you. He's kept you thinking that God's heart isn't good so that you don't fully trust him. You wonder why when you pray, your prayers don't get answered because maybe in your heart you've got a little unforgiveness. Maybe in your heart you blame God. Because so many things have happened in your life and you think, where was God? Where, why couldn't He stop this? Why didn't He intervene? But that's all the enemy needs. He just needs you to undermine God's faithfulness because God is there. He does have things for you to walk in that are good. He's got assignments for you that only you can do. Nobody else on the whole planet can do but you. But you have to trust Him. You have to fully trust Him and that His heart is good and that He will work it out for you. I was reading one of my, the scriptures that I love because it just rocks me every time I read it. Um, Jeremiah 15 verse 19. To give you a little preface on this story, Jeremiah, prophet in the Old Testament, very much used of God, prophet, you know, so amazing things happen. But he is totally having a pity party right now. He is whining to God, he's having a pity party, he is not happy at all with the situation, what's going on in his life. And the Lord comes down and he says to Jeremiah, if you return to me and give up this mistaken tone of distrust and despair, then I will give you again a settled place of quiet and safety, and you shall be my minister. And if you separate the precious from the vile, now before I read the rest of the verse, what do you think God calls vile? Most people go, oh, it's my unclean thoughts, oh, it's my unfinished business, it's the, the mistake I made yesterday. Listen to what God calls vile which is cleansing your own heart from unworthy suspicions concerning God's faithfulness, you shall be my mouthpiece. Ouch. Yes. Unworthy suspicions concerning God's faithfulness. That's what happens. We have this mistaken tone of distrust and despair in our hearts because things happen. And you know what? <clears throat> Maybe you need to forgive God. What? God doesn't need my forgiveness. You're right, He doesn't. You do. You have to forgive Him. Sometimes that's what it takes. Sometimes it's allowing yourself to go, you know what God, I, I, I ask you to forgive me for holding that in my heart because the, the enemy <clears throat> likes to keep that in you and you can't love anybody with a half a heart. You can't do anything you're called to do with only a half a heart and if you're trusting God's goodness and faithfulness, how can you have any faith towards God? <clears throat> you know, I, uh, how does this fairy tale end? A story is only as good as its ending, right? Um, uh, I'm a huge Roger Federer fan. If anybody knows me, tennis, Roger Federer, he's my guy, okay? 
I am a fanatic. I am up early in the morning. I am chewing off my fingernails if he's not doing well. You know, I wake up in the morning, I wonder if he had a good night's sleep. <laughs> I told you, I've got issues. <laughs> the one time, it was a while back, we were watching, I don't know, Wimbledon or US Open or whatever it was, and watching the game, in the middle of the game, my dad goes, hey, pause it, let's go get food. Wait. <laughs> Go get the food, come back. I am pacing. I want to know how he's doing. You know, so I go to my room and I Google. And I see, oh, okay, game's still going on. I come back out, I'm like, the game is still going on. My dad goes, you went and Googled the game? I was like, yes. He's like, you're going to ruin all the excitement of knowing what happens. I go, no, dad. If I know he's winning, it releases the fear and I can watch and enjoy. <laughs> like I said, I've got issues. <laughs> but you know, that's like life sometimes. Good. It's like if, if sometimes if we know, the enemy likes to have hold you with fear. Because the fear of the unknown, fear of what's going to happen if, if I don't get to pay this bill, fear of what's going to happen if, if that check doesn't come in, fear of what's going to happen if, you're, if your marriage is having a, a tough time. And if you have fear, you can't have faith. They can't coexist. And if you read the Bible and you trust God's goodness, then you know you, it releases the fear. Because you know what? We win. We win. Amen. God is good. He has got a plan for you. And I, I've read the end of the book, and we do win, folks. And you know what? When God heals you, when God heals somebody's heart, it's like he calls it the, the healing balm of Gilead because there's no flapping scar left. There's no open wound left when God heals something. What I love about God is that he can be sovereign Lord, creator of the universe, and at the same time, your best friend. Amen. And I've learned over the years to have a relationship with God that supersedes any relationship I have on this planet. And that in a moment when something is wrong, when I get bad news, I run and I go, Daddy, help. My attitude has changed because He has an answer. He has help. He is there for me. I heard, uh, I, I read just a couple days ago, um, something Rick Warren said, I mean I know a lot of people know he lost his son suicide and, uh, and the pain he's gone through and he said God never wastes a hurt. What the enemy has tried to destroy you with, what the enemy has tried to break you with, to break your spirit, God's not going to waste that hurt. A lot of times your greatest ministry will come from your greatest hurt. I don't want to have to stand up and tell people all my mistakes that I've made, and I've made plenty more. I shortened it because of the time. Um, <laughs> but it's through that, it's like every time I get to tell the story, it's like, take that devil. Yeah. <laughs> you try to destroy me, you try to break me, you try to lie to me, well I'll show you what that'll do. <laughs> I'm going to help other people get free. I'm going to help other people get over their hurts and see that God loves them and see the goodness of God and turn back to God. Um, my mom, and people always ask, how's my mom? Over 60, my mom only has 42% of her brain in her head if you see the CAT scan, because once the brain dies, it disintegrates and goes down the spine. So if you see a CAT scan, she's only got 42% of her brain. Um, she's paralyzed on the right side of her body, but she walks with a cane. She's got 85% of her speech. She's got all of her memory. Uh, she's got a great sense of humor. Uh, my dad says he likes her, the fact that she's only got 85% of her speech back because he likes the 15% advantage. <laughs> <laughs> when they went to uh, China to do stem cells, uh, the communist doctors looked at my mom wow. and they said, when they saw the x-rays through the interpreter, they said, not possible. Wow. Not possible for you to walk, not possible for you to see, not possible for you to talk. My dad's like, why? Because everything that controls that is gone. It doesn't exist in your head. That part of the brain, you've, I'm sure you've heard stories, people get a little bruise on their brain and they start losing speech or they start forgetting something. Half, more than half of the brain is gone. The doctors looked at it and said, the part that controls that is not there. You cannot do this. And they kept saying, miracle. Miracle. Communist doctors in, in China. Miracle. Because she is, my mom is a miracle of faith. Uh, 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 the gift of faith operates in her life. She is a, like my dad always says, when the Red Sea parted and the people walked through, it wasn't so much the miracle of the Red Sea parting, it was for how long it stayed open for them all to walk through. She is a sustaining miracle that she's living in. So God, there, there are victories, you know, I know this is a lot of hurt today, but I, I, I just want you, when you have your own time, 
to take time in your heart, or maybe you know somebody that's been through stuff in their life, and encourage them about the goodness of God and about forgiveness and, and even forgiving God um, and moving forward because He does have amazing things for you all to do and uh, great assignments that the devil would like to keep you from doing because any time bad things happen and we judge God's goodness, well, what are you going to do if you judge the hero in the story? So that's all I had to share. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that and hopefully you uh, can Thanks, Roger.